concept of today is is basically fourfold. First, to ensure common understanding of key elements and approach for the 2021 HPC. Uh, and the, in order to be able to have an effective and harmonized uh, planning cycle. So agree on the key elements and the approach. So we're all pushing in the same direction, especially if there is different interpretations of this approach by OCHA or other clusters in these operations that we, we know this is how we interpret it and how we're going. The second is to present and discuss the key elements and proposed approach for the for the intersectoral part uh, uh, of the HNO, as well as the sectoral analysis uh, that feeds into the HNO. So we'll be very clear how we we want to contribute to these two parts. Uh, when we propose that to you, we will obtain questions and feedbacks. We will see the cracks in what we're presenting uh, and advice from you. And based on this conversation, we will issue uh, the global written guidance uh, that will go to you to, to be sure the message are uh, black and white uh, and clear. And finally, uh, we want to outline uh, support and resources that we have ready to support you in this process. Um, and also hear advice from you uh, how, to best, uh, how to best do that. So to do this, uh, we have. Uh, we will start the session with uh, with introductory uh, messages uh, regarding the the HPC. Uh, I will. I have three key messages followed by uh, by Bruno and Jennifer, who who both also have additional messages. Bruno uh, comes uh, uh, as uh, uh, as part and head of the MA uh, AOR. Uh, and then Jennifer from the GBV uh, AOR. And at the end of the session, we'll have closing remarks uh, from uh, HLP uh, uh, and child protection. And this way we kind of wrap this, uh, uh, this session together. In the middle is the most important bit where we will have colleagues going through uh, the, uh, the different parts of the guidance. So let me start with three Key William? messages. Uh, yes. Sorry, just uh, Jennifer, Bruno are not yet on, on the call. Maybe they're having problems. So I'll let you know. Um, other, other sure. Way. Thanks. I'll, I'm, good. So let me start uh, then with uh, with three uh, key messages from me, and maybe I'll cover for the messages uh, of the others uh, if, if that doesn't work. Uh, first and most important is that uh, we are. We hear you and we see you. And this year is extraordinary. It's your, usually a pain to have the HPC cycle, but this year is on the double. You have appeals, you have the GHRP, you have the COVID situation, you have less access to the field. So we are advocating for a simplified 2021 HPC approach. Uh, we have worked with the global clusters for a simplified GF guidance. Uh, we're advocating basically to have no major changes introduced this year. I think the last couple of years, every year there was a, uh, now we are advocating for no major changes uh, to be introduced this year. Uh, and we want you to, 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 to echo this message. We will make sure OCHA is on board and the other clusters with this, but uh, least changes, uh, keep steady and minimize uh, the work is uh, is very important for us. My second message is that uh, joint analysis of protection risks, risks, violations, and harm. And I insist on risks because it has been such a struggle to convince everyone that from a protection perspective, we plan based on risks. So joint analysis of protection risks, violations, and harm should be central elements in the HNO analysis, in the intersectoral analysis. And you should be a driving force behind defining this. We have worked with uh, within the GIAG to ensure the analysis of protection risks, threats, and vulnerabilities are key in the methodology and agreed as such. Uh, what's very particular and important is to define the scope of the humanitarian analysis and response. And that's two things priority affected geographic areas. And this is in line 
with many of your pushes to have a area based approaches, which we encourage. Uh, so we want to see the this protection risks analysis uh, reflected in a priority defined priority affected geographic area and population groups, which is extremely important uh, in our case. And we've seen this in the COVID situation where specific groups have uh, uh, have exacerbated yes. an additional yes. risks uh, due to that. Let me see who is unmuted here. Uh, uh, thank you, Khidr. Much appreciated. Uh, so that's my second point. Uh, basically, joint analysis of protection risks, violations, and harms should remain central. And we have to have priority geographic areas and focus on population groups as well. Third, uh, and here is a, uh, is a uh, if you take one thing out of this meeting, is, is to me is this. Where we stand today is that protection size in the HRP is about 8% uh, on average. And that includes all the AORs and, and beyond the AORs work. So if you look at specific AORs like GBV or child protection or MA, HLP, but other stuff like work on disability and work on elderly people, the percentage of, of what we're submitting in the HRP is less than 8%. And uh, again, if we go to the specifics, it's much less than this. Of course, uh, this is not acceptable. We need a major push to uh, reflect the reality that in protection crises, the size of protection response needs to be reflected in the initial submission of the HRP. So we want you to, to have, uh, we haven't defined uh, scientifically benchmarks, and we're working on that. We will probably not be ready for this year, but we'll use this year as a as a testing ground. But here are some indicative uh, directions, and here I'm speaking to the coordinators, co-coordinators uh, of AORs and the uh, uh, the cluster. The protection should be at least between 15 and 20 percent of the total humanitarian requirements. This is a logical uh, span of percentage that we think would reflect in crises that are protection in nature uh, to be to be reasonable and to allow you to run the proper response. 15 to 20 percent. That would require to do that a solid HNO, a solid HRP, and massive advocacy with the HCs, HCTs. Uh, your cluster lead agencies to push in this direction, and we're more than happy to to push for this, and we're we're advocating for that loud and clear in all for us, including with donors. So that should be uh, your uh, your your overall kind of direction. Second, we're pushing all donors to fund the protection at at least fifty percent. So of what we submit to have at least 50% of the protection submissions funded. Today, we stand at, again, an average of 8-9%. Um, and as I said, we will have this high level segment at the end of the year where we have a major push at uh, capital level with donors uh, to, to challenge them uh, throughout. Uh, to meet that 50% next year. This is extremely important timing as well because we judge that next year funding size compared to the needs will be even less than this year because the needs are growing and also many of the donors are looking inwards and will have less ODA going outwards. So we, we will keep the pressure on to keep that point on the agenda. Also, we want to see that other clusters are mainstreaming protection, not only in narrative and approach, but also in budget. So we'd like to, we are challenging the other clusters to, uh, to put at least 5% uh, of their program dedicated for mainstream uh, protection. And that could be much more in many parts. I mean, if you take the GBV collaboration with the health cluster, 
there is much more than 5% of the health response that could be linked to protection and so on. But I think the indication we're saying is everyone should at least have these 5% uh, and, and go, uh, go forward. So this is a bit my, uh, the three points I wanted, um, I wanted to make. Uh, I want to check if Bruno is, uh, is online. If not, Ivan, is, uh, did, he didn't manage yet to connect? No, I don't see no. him and neither uh, Jennifer yet. Yeah. Neither Jennifer. Okay, so let me put on my uh, MAAOR hat, uh, global hat here. And on behalf uh, of Bruno, I think uh, the AOR wanted to really highlight two points uh, in addition to my first three. First, so fourth, we should reinforce our efforts to ensure inclusivity and people-centered HNO and HRP. What does that mean uh, practically? Uh, disaggregated analysis of the differential impacts of the crisis on diverse groups and people, uh, gender, age, disability, other characteristics, both in the intersectoral part and the sectoral part, needs to be there. And I think many of you do quite well on this front. Many others receive some pushback, especially on the differential impact part. Uh, that has to be front and center in the intersectoral analysis as well as the sectoral analysis. And also that means that we have uh, we need better efforts to consider priorities of affected population to inform the analysis through uh, the engagement with communities. Many of your clusters have solid uh, engagement with communities programs. Um, uh, Child Protection, uh, MAAOR has a mass fantastic networks where you are established uh, of engagement with communities, uh, local organizations, community leaders, affected people. Uh, Child Protection have the same for uh, uh, for, for this work. And I think we need to benefit from these established networks, not only for what uh, the relationship is designed for, which is sometimes response or monitoring. I think engaging them throughout the cycle in a way that is documented and in incremental from year to year and proving it, putting that forward. I think our best tool uh, that, that you're telling us uh, in contexts where there is lack of access is proving to be these, um, these relationships you have established with communities in some cases for decades. So bring that to the front and make sure it's, uh, it's clearly reflected uh, in the way uh, uh, we're contributing to the HNO, we're building it up. My fifth point is that uh, we need to keep expanding on integrated and multi-sectoral responses. Uh, so we need to uh, continue promoting this integrated joint programming with other sectors. I mean, the child protection uh, work uh, you're, uh, that is done is, uh, with other sectors is, is, uh, is established, is very good. MAAOR uh, as well, HLP is a natural one with a couple of sectors, including shelter. GBV is also so established with, uh, with other uh, sectors, including uh, health and education and others. So we need to bring the reality, this reality of uh, that protection doesn't only belong to the protection cluster. Uh, we need to bring that forward in the analysis, and we uh, uh, we have to focus on this integrated analysis, integrated programming, and integrated approaches. Uh, we have uh, a couple of uh, uh, global efforts. Uh, we've done all together this uh, collaboration with the health cluster. We have this collective uh, operational framework that is moving in this direction. That's important. Uh, GPC, CPMA, education, health uh, uh, for for child victims uh, are uh, is also in progress and has you have heard about it, and is also an area of focus. So let's uh, let's reflect that, keep expanding. I think this is the, f uh, the future 
uh, your future there. Um, and now I would turn to, to the last two points, uh, probably on behalf of the GBV AOR, unless Jennifer managed to connect. Jen? Jen is not there. Astrid, are you there? No. Okay. Uh, so, two final points uh, here, uh, and then we close the opening uh, remarks. Um, AOR specificity is, is not only the responsibility of the AOR per se to push for their space. It's the responsibility of all of you to push for the space and the specificity of all of you. Uh, and that's how we address this at the global level. Uh, we need to build uh, on the progress observed in 2020 HPC. Uh, we have around 70% of the HNOs and HRPs with specific AOR sections. This is not acceptable. This year, we need to hit 100% and aim to systematically include AOR-specific sections within the protection uh, cluster chapter in all the HNOs and HRPs. So this is already in, included in the templates. We need you uh, to, to, to fill that role and to support each other. If one of the AORs uh, or the, the general protection is weak uh, for a temporary period because of lack of staff to be able to generate the right data or to write the right paragraph and narrative, support each other, fill that bank. It is a collective responsibility to take that uh, forward, as well as uh, uh, some additional responsibilities on top of you. We have established structures for the four AORs, but there are some other key protection areas, like protection of civilians, anti-trafficking, mental health, uh, protection of older persons and persons with disabilities. Uh, these are major needs you're facing in your operation and should be reflected as such in the HNO and the HRP. And, and of course, I personally count a lot on the cluster coordinators to do that, but it's equally the responsibility of the AORs coordinators to bring that to the, for, uh, to the front. We, we have to focus on, on our specificity and bring that visibly forward. But we should also look at so certain areas where no one has claimed the responsibility, like the AORs. Uh, and finally, uh, the setup of the HPC tools uh, should follow global policy agreed with OCHA. Uh, so uh, the GPC and the AOR are in, we're, in, we're engaging with OCHA at the global level to ensure that the OCHA field offices and protection clusters and AORs get a very clear message on systematic harmonized setup of the different HPC tool for the response planning module, for the FTS, uh, to allow aggregation, reporting, and tracking of AOR projects and activities. This is the global guidance. If someone in the field interprets it differently, uh, we should push back. Uh, we are very keen to know a uh, link to the funding situation that, uh, that as I explained in, uh, in, uh, in the initial part there, uh, to, for us to beef up this 50%, we need to be very focused in the global advocacy and say the weak link in this operation is, uh, uh, is gender-based violence. The weak link in this operation is general monitoring. The weak link in this operation is housing, land, and property. And for us to be able to do that and scale it up, we need specific data. And for that, we really count on you. Should OCHA have a different uh, interpretation to link up with us, and that's our job to keep pushing until uh, until it's done. Uh, that is my our collective uh, main seven points. Uh, I am sorry I've spoken for uh, on behalf of three people, 
Uh, it should be taken as such. Uh, apologies for the monotonic voice. It should have been three different voices. Um, William. Um, but ah, Jennifer, you may. Yeah, it. sorry. I, I was having a hard time getting into the Teams because we don't really have that system. So I apologize for being late. Um, no worries. <laughs> and I thank you. I, I think you covered pretty much everything. So I appreciate you. And that's an example of how we support each other. If one AOR is absent, or if the GPC, the the, the, the um, protection coordinators are absent, we fill in for each other. So 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 thank you, um, and I, I think it was very eloquently said. Um, I, I guess I would just reinforce that you know we know that the the humanitarian needs overview is is critical to have a strong narrative that's very context specific. It shouldn't sound like you cut and pasted it from the last operation you were in, but really be specific to the context where you are, because we know that later when we're requesting funding, it's based on the, the narrative of the needs. So, so it's very important to be as specific as, as possible and have that be strong. And we, as William said, we worked very hard for OCHA to enable us to have more space specific to each AOR. So um, last year we know that uh, for the there was an increase, for example, in, in gender-based violence in having an entire page dedicated to the situation of GBV. And we know that now with COVID-19, there's been an increase in intimate partner violence. Um, so really, this is an opportunity to have a very strong narrative specific to each AOR um, and it, that can range from a paragraph to a page um, and uh, this is finally a chance for everybody to have the space that they need to to discuss um, the, the situation and not have to push each other. I know in the past it was always like one page for everyone together and that was um, a very, very challenging. So this is definitely an opportunity, as, as William also mentioned, for everyone to be, to be able to provide a strong narrative around protection and for each specific um, AOR. And, you know, I think it, we also we have those specific areas for each AOR, but we also want to be very cohesive and comprehensive with the overall protection picture. So, so it should still flow um, as looking at the comprehensive needs as a cluster. Um, so again, working together, I know on the information management side, at the global level, there's been a lot of work done between the um, the GPC and the four AORs so that we are clear on and having consistency when we do the pin and when we look at the severity ranking. There's been a lot of efforts made. Um, so I hope that also at the field level, that effort of working together um, will be strong and, and it makes us stronger as a cluster and will uh, in, enhance our opportunities to, to get more funding. Um, I know that you've already had quite a bit of opening from William speaking for three people, so um, I think I can uh, leave it there. And I just realized I didn't turn on my video, so I will do that for a moment. So I'm Jennifer Chase. I'm from the GBV area of responsibility um, at the global level, and I'm very excited that this is the beginning of the GPC forum, and we're going to have more um, for also uh, the response and looking at FTS, which are other areas where we also have improvements um, and we need to work together to, to be strong. So that's it from my side and I hope you have a very good webinar. Thanks, Jennifer. William, just checking if I be mute.
Okay, maybe. Um, uh, go ahead, William. I think you were. Nothing more from my side. Please, <laughs> please go ahead, Ivan. Thanks, uh, thanks uh, a lot, William and Jennifer and, and colleagues for the introduction. So um, let me just go back quickly. Um, so well, first of all, uh, thanks everyone for joining. Um, uh, well, for those who don't know me, my name is Ivan Cardona, Global uh, Information Management Officer with DGPC, and uh, I mean, I've been working um, together with um, colleagues in the GPC upsells and uh, the areas of responsibilities on uh, this year on um, contributing uh, and preparing the discussions for um, the HPC guidance, sectoral guidance. So, um, yeah, this is the, the collective effort of that. Just on the agenda quickly, um, we're uh, yeah, kind of 10 minutes uh, a bit behind, but I will uh, try to summarize. Um, the next session, which is um, the presentation of key elements and key recommendations, more or less in, in the line that uh, William and Jennifer were already pointing out on uh, HNOs and HRPs for 2021. Uh, and then we'll open for uh, discussion, questions, feedback from, from you. I think, uh, as mentioned at the beginning from William, uh, the part of the purpose of today, uh, a big part is hearing from you um to see what uh, other areas or challenges or recommendations we need to to make sure to include in uh, in the global guidance sectoral guidance uh, and in our support for this year we'll have a break i think around 10 50 or so uh 10 minutes before 11 a, a quick break just to recharge energies and then we'll go to the second part which is um a focus on the hno um, presenting to you the key elements approach uh, that are planned for the intersectoral and sectoral analysis uh, of severity of needs and pin calculations in the HNO, but also other key elements uh, on the central protection there. And again, open for for questions and feedback, and and we'll close on with some final remarks by by the other um, AOR coordinators. So let me quickly start. Um, with this uh, and please as we as yeah we go along on, on the presentation we'll uh, yeah have a, a then the the feedback session but please feel free to start writing your questions or or comments in in the chat or or make them during during that part of the of the webinar um so quickly uh, on the hpc so yeah last year um, we had 28 countries with HNOs uh, and 25 with HRPs. Uh, the difference was um, the Central American countries, Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, that um, had an HNO this, this, uh, for this year, uh, released recently, but uh, not, not yet uh, an HRP. Um, and in total, yeah, we're talking about 96 million overall people in need of protection. Um, that was in the original uh, HRPs. Um, uh, I understand now uh, with the COVID uh, update, uh, some uh, pins are being revised, uh, although not in all operations uh, by sector. Um, and about half of them uh, targeted in the HRP plans. And as William was mentioning, an, an overall loss of $2 billion, uh, including uh, 300 million additionally included as part of the, the COVID-19 response. So more, in, more important, sorry, just hearing uh, uh, from a colleague in the chat that she's having problems listening or he, uh, I'm not sure, uh, just confirm and everyone else can hear me well. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Okay, okay, thanks. <laughs> um, okay, so um, yeah, more on the process side of things, which is also the the more on the key recommendations for today. Among the key highlights, uh, I think uh, the analysis of protection concerns that um, you uh, and colleagues in the field contributed significantly, both uh, particularly in the intersectoral narrative of the HNOs and HRPs was very solid um, indeed even in the 
um, independent scoring process that happens every year with HNLC HRPs that is done by donors and some key agencies, lead agencies. Uh, this one of one of the areas that had the highest score. Uh, we also saw enhanced protection analysis uh, in the sectoral chapters, uh, in the protection chapters, um, and including, as was mentioned also by William and Jennifer, specific sessions on AO, AORs, uh, figures, narrative, um, enhanced also disaggregation of the analysis of the figures by uh, sex, age, uh, disability, and other criteria. Uh, Obviously, now is man, is um, one of the key areas of the enhanced approach is having all these figures disaggregated by by some specific groups. But we we see also that in the narrative, this was um, better reflected. Um, again, in the majority of HRPs, we saw also big requirements and response priorities for AORs, although not in all of them. An increased reference to integrated programming um, was mentioned in several, uh, and we know also this has been growing a growing trend um, with uh, multi-cluster responses or um, yeah, integrated programming um, also within the cluster, obviously. And uh, another key highlighting was the, and also as, as we have listened from you, uh, collaboration, communication with the global team, so of the cluster and the AORs. Um, which was particularly, I think, um, um, for the HNO season, the needs analysis, needs interpretation part, um, but also throughout the, the HPC. Uh, but for this year, we, we want to make sure there is um, a continuous support uh, both for the HNOs and HRP components. But obviously, there were also some key challenges um, uh, that, yeah, we have heard from you uh, and also some related to to some um, guidance that might be missing and that we're working this year. So obviously one was constraints uh, for the new uh, and enhanced approach for intersectoral and sectoral severity and its analysis due to yeah, lack of data or lack of sources um, to contribute to, to the new approach, which obviously for this year might be an, uh, an additional or a compounded challenge given the, the situation of COVID-19. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, also, uh, one of the key challenges that we heard, and it also came out in uh, intersectoral evaluations of the HNO, the confusions or lack of clarity on the new and uh, intersectoral um, severity analysis and peak calculations, which resulted in a mixed approach. We saw particularly on the whole discussion about the humanitarian consequence pillars uh, because of the confusing or mixed messages um, in global guidance um, uh, or the lack or delay. So on that, the, uh, as you know, the JAF, the Joint Intersectoral Framework was introduced, but there was not a, a finalized guidance. So that ended up that we have um, yeah, uh, kind of three, four uh, different approaches in the field that we saw some using four uh, pillars, including the protection one, others using only two, others three. Uh, but also some contributing to, to the other two pillars, so overlaps. So yeah, uh, in the second part of, of today webinar, we'll, we'll go a bit more in what are the plan changes to, to have a clear approach for this year. Uh, the limited space for the protection chapter narrative. So as mentioned, we saw an increased use of the specific sessions, but obviously also the limited space um, uh, implies that not always the narrative could be as, as as comprehensive, so um, I think yeah, this will uh, require a more advocacy. So we have a proper space on this, but also more more focus analysis. Um, tight deadlines and challenges with the management of project submissions. We we know this is um, a key a key concern, and uh, and um, also as William was mentioning, the the diversity in the weight or proportion of the protection funding over the total asks. Um, uh, and finally, and we'll go a bit more in detail about that, different approaches for the setup of, of HPC tools. So we'll go into that a, a few more. Um, what are the expected key changes for the for this year? As mentioned uh, at the, in the introduction, um, we and also most of the or all the other global clusters and lead agencies have been advocating for a simplified approach. Um, so 
considering the realities of this year. The, the key elements of the HPC approach, uh, the templates particularly, will fundamentally remain the same. There will be a slight modifications to try to simplify and also to adapt to the discussions on the on the particularly for the HNO on the joint intersector framework as we will go in the second part. Um, it is expected and recognized by everyone and also donors that there will be a need to use secondary data as much as possible, expert judgment due to constraints in primary data collection. One obviously key change compared to last year and what has been happening in these recent months is that the COVID response will be integrated uh, into the normal HPC cycle, so there will be no separate plans, uh, addendums, or uh, um, uh, yeah, not not a, also a separate global humanitarian response plan for COVID, but to be integrated in in the normal response for next year. And as was already included in, in last year uh, enhanced approach, uh, but this year even more um, more uh, relevant and increased focus on risk analysis and projections, which for COVID-19 I think is key. There has been a uh, work on a global guidance on this uh, that is being finalized. So quickly um, on this, uh, on the key areas of focus, um, as William uh, was mentioning also, and we'll go more in detail about the in the second part. Um, uh, clusters and AORs in the field need to take um, uh, an active lead role, as you do usually and you have done last year, to ensure that central protection is properly reflected both in the intersectoral analysis, but also in the response prioritization. And one key area of this is uh, to ensure that priority most affected areas, geographical areas and groups are um, prioritized both in the analysis and in the response. Second, um, as William was mentioning, uh, to reinforce our efforts to ensure more inclusive and people-centered approaches in HNOs and HRPs. And uh, here I would like to pass the, the word to Ahmed. I hope you can hear me well. Um, as um, yeah, that will give you us uh, a bit of more uh, details, some recommendations for uh, inclusions of uh, uh, disability persons with disability in HNOs and HRP. Samet, can you hear as well? Yes, thank you, Ivan. Perfect. Go ahead. Um, hi, everyone. Ahmed Ghanim, uh, working uh, for UNICEF, program specialist in uh, disability inclusion, and also. I'm a coordinator of advisory group for disability inclusion humanitarian action uh, related to David uh, UN single business case. Uh, actually, it's um, uh, thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, a person with disability actually have um, a great uh, part of um, to access to protection intervention as equal member of the community under the GBC mandate. But also we should recognize to which extent they are uh, affected by conflict and displacement uh, more than other because of the barrier that they are facing usually. Um, they are facing a huge barrier to access to protection services, but also to generally in humanitarian services. Uh, usually these barriers, we all know it, but mostly they are physical barriers uh, to access to facilities due to their uh, disability. Uh, also communication barriers to access to information that usually disseminated in this situation uh, or actually reach outing or seeking support, uh, attitudinal barriers that is happening either by uh, ignoring their cause or having some discriminatory action toward them from either the staff or the community itself. Institutional barriers was and which I think it's what or also which is very important that we design systems that is providing services and most of the time this system itself are not inclusive or accessible for these people. Uh, knowing that actually um, the um, the number of persons with disability who have a very high number of estimation, like 15% of world population have disability, and also to which extent they this group is 
um, having a diverse, they are not one group, they are diverse, they have a heterogeneity among them, they are have intersectionality with others. For example, uh, one of in five of women likely to be have some sort of disability. Uh, and here we can see how gender is interacting with disability. Also, now like 46 percent of a person aged uh, 16 and above are have some sort of disability, nearly the half uh, in uh, case of male and in case of uh, female. And in this case, you can imagine to which extent uh, that um, 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 age and disability and gender is interacting to each other to produce some barriers that or risk factor that could um, um, also affect the situation of person with disability. Uh, children also, ne nearly one in ten a uh, child is the children with disability and we all face how it's it's very difficult in 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 general for children to access protection but also for children with disability is even more difficult this kind of um, 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 intervention that is linked for example to child protection um, gender based violence should be ensured that they consider this high level or high number this group of persons with disability and how this group are diverse and having some intersectionality with other uh, topic. Um, um, we should also consider that most of this number are very old. Most of this estimation are very old and it's a global estimation. Most of the time also it's applied to all the world, but in even in humanitarian context, we expect that it's much higher than that. Uh, we should consider that um, 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 that also um, uh, recent studies that have been uh, done at country level, at, at region level, for example, vulnerability assessment framework at Jordan have seen that personal disability is more than 21 percent of the population, affected population. In Syria, they are Syria, they are 27 percentage. In Afghanistan, we have like nearly 40 percent is severe and 65 percent of population all population have some sort of moderate to mild disability according to last analysis had been done in afghanistan and it's expected in this humanitarian action and years of inability to access to humanitarian support or due to the war or the crisis that is happening in a specific place that level of uh, impairment is increased and in this case also level of disability is increasing um i think uh, next please uh, uh, could you have a could we have a, thank you we have done actually uh, an analysis in 2020 hbc document hnohrb to see to which extent disability have been included on side the document that have been produced at the time of the analysis we have like um, uh, nearly um, um, uh, um, 20 HNO and or um, uh, a little bit less and nearly 17 HRB have been analyzed from different country. Uh, one of the, the main um, finding that we have uh, find that protection was always the highest uh, cluster and the highest section inside HNOHRB that is covering disability, uh, not only just recognizing the fact that disability is there, but also having some sort of robust uh, analysis of uh, the risk that they are facing and to which extent they are uh, have been identified as a, a part of vulnerable group, but in the same time with a specific needs and requirement. So it was a very good uh, comparing to, for example, HNOHRB. HRB uh, 2019. It's, there was a, a huge uh, progress and in most of the time protection section inside the HNOHRB have been doing that, which is great. And I think this is uh, um, this is very important because as uh, our colleague was talking in the beginning of the slides on the proportion of protection inside the HBC it itself and the humanitarian action, it's also very important if we have a disability, good disability inclusion in protection uh, part inside HNOHRB, most of the time this lead to improve the, uh, the situation of person with disability in general on our HBC cycle. 
So what was our main finding? What was our main lesson learned from the uh, analysis of HBC that we would like to consider in 2021? First, the analysis. It's very important not only to mention person's ability because most of the time we see that the HNO, HRB saying that uh, and we should consider vulnerable group and then uh, between brackets, uh, children, woman, uh, person's disability, and so on. So they are just mentioned vulnerable group. We need to ensure that there are some sort of analysis of the factors that is contributing to risk so we can differentiate person's disability from other vulnerable group but also differentiate different uh, groups inside person's disability, uh, woman with disability, children with disability, refugee with disability, uh, to ensure that we are able to have a meaningful uh, need of our view and meaningful or, of course, intervention, uh, which is also linked to intersectionality and how the diversity that we have explained is intersect or impact the risk that is faced by person disability. And we were discussing, for example, in COVID, to which extent the situation of um, uh, lockdown have increased the GBV, and this have been having even more effect, a uh, very high effect on women with disability, for example, due to communication and access problem that we was talking about. Participation also is very important. Uh, one of the central idea of uh, the new HBC and the, the coming one should be around people centered and we cannot be able to be people centered without to ensure that the people themselves their opinion their understanding their priority their needs have been expressed uh, by them and we are accountable to them and one of the main issue here is participation to which extent we are creating an inclusive process that we able to consult with person with disability and engaged local organization of person with disability. Because most of the time, even we see that even if HNO, HRB have creating this kind of consulting mechanism and accountability mechanism, usually some group who have no access to this mechanism due to communication barriers or access barriers or physical barriers, they are unable or even attitude in some cases, considering that they, they don't have opinion or something like that, lead to that they are neglected or forgotten or left behind uh, for in participation. Data collection also is a very important and it's a high, uh, high actually uh, challenge. We are now working on how to ensure that monitoring framework that we are creating in HNO, HRB are disability inclusive in the light of COVID and we will produce a, a guidance note on that uh, shortly in, in the next months, but also having a reliable and up-to-date information about person with disability is very important. Um, not only about the numbers, uh, but also about the barrier that is facing them. Uh, we can depend on global disability prevalence, but as I explained, we can we should be very careful when we are using it and using it only if we don't have any other resources. Because having the global disability prevalence is most of the time are not accurate because of the fact that we was discussing the humanitarian context, the all the data that we have and so on. So the best scenario is if we have an, a good administrative data, most of the time our humanitarian context we don't if we have able to collect our data ourselves and the most easy way to do it is to integrate disability question which is washington group of question inside your regular data collection tool and if you do that that it's a f five very simple question it will not take any uh, big time from the survey itself or whatever and this will create a, a whole um, um, world of difference and at the end depend on national estimation or regional estimation or at the last resource global estimation or prevalence could be a good uh, way to do if we don't have a uh, robust secondary data. Last thing is and I think it's very important to understand and usually I found that people working in protection is understanding that very well because you are facing the same the same concept the twin track approach we need to ensure that when we are 
dealing with disability, we have the twin track approach. We are one track. We are focusing on the need of persons with disability, uh, responding, responding to a specific disability need and providing a specific disability um, uh, services. But in the same time, we we don't need to forget the mainstreaming that we what we are usually that persons with disability have the same need as the other population. So we need to ensure that what we are doing is completely accessible and mainstreamed for persons with disability to access. So if we are design uh, GBV services, for example, we need to ensure that uh, women with disability have access to as any other woman in the group, which is the same situation as protection. Usually we have the mainstreaming protection and the specific protection services. It's a very similar concept in disability, and we need to ensure that this is, is happening in the right way. Um, uh, the last, uh, the next slide, please. So I know that this is a very short time to explain all this about disability, but there are a lot of related resources and guidance. All that is URL. So once you have the the PowerPoint, you can able to click on it and go directly to the URL. I will just scan it very quickly. We have um, uh, some resources related to disability and HNO HRP. Uh, we have guidance on strengthening disability inclusion in humanitarian response plan, and the guidance have been designed in the same uh, OCHA template. So following it will not be an added work. It will be in, in line and parallel to your current work. We have also some uh, very quick tip sheets uh, in integration disability in HNO, only two pages, and is the same in HRB. Sorry for the mistake on the, in the title. And then we have also last year uh, a very um, interesting, informing uh, GBC uh, Global Protection Cluster webcast on disability inclusive in HNO HRB. It's are recorded in video and is available on YouTube. Um, we know also that there are some, I will say, upper level uh, concepts related to the humanitarian response and disability in general. And we, in that, we have IACC guideline, inclusion of persons with disability in humanitarian action. You see the, the, um, the cover in the beginning of the slides. And also, UNICEF have a very um, um, good, including children with disability in humanitarian action, including protection and education and other issue. It's an online URL uh, guideline, but we know that the current situation needs a specific attention to COVID, and COVID will be integrated in HNO HRP. So we have two resources related to specifically to COVID and humanitarian context. One is disability inclusion tip sheet for the GHRB update. And I think most of what is existing there is applicable also in HNO HRB. And the second one, which is just have been, it's now it's written under development, but it have been issued this morning, so it's good uh, that I think um, have been issued a guideline on inclusion of person disability in COVID-19 response, which is a very uh, small one that is depending on the big guideline of humanitarian disability and humanitarian response. Uh, thank you. Um, um, if you have any question, I'm not sure if, if it's the time for it. Uh, Ivan, could you guide me if I, I'm ready for any question or discussion point, or do you prefer to postpone it? Thanks a lot uh, for that very useful presentation. Yeah, I'll just finish quickly with the other points uh, and then we'll open for discussions. I think we can Great. take questions, but colleagues, please, if you have questions or, or comments, please. Uh, you can start adding them in the in the chat of the meeting. I, I already see one request to share uh, the presentation and yes, um, we will confirm we, we will be able to to share the whole uh, presentation and additional material after the webinar. So thanks a lot. Just to go quickly on the other two points, I think we already touched upon some of them. Uh, but yeah, within the other key areas of focus, as mentioned, the the increased visibility and use uh, that we want to ensure is systematically done for next year on the specific uh, AOR uh, sections, both in the HNO and the HRP. And as mentioned, we will um, also advocate at the global level that um, yeah, um, we need to expand it, um, space in, in the document, so this analysis is comprehensive enough. 
And then, as what was also mentioned at the beginning in the introduction message by um, William Jennifer, we want to ensure we have an harmonized approach for the setup and management of HPC tools. Um, last year, in, a, in the sectoral guidance for HPC, um, there was an agreement, an agreed approach uh, between OCHA and the GPC and AORs on how to do this, but we know that it was not fully implemented systematically um, in the operations. Um, some uh, field offices from OCHA the, um, went for different approaches, but also there were some uh, technical limitations on FTS. So we have been uh, talking with OCHA this year on this and will be aiming to send soon a message to all OCHA offices, all uh, clusters and AORs uh, that this is the recommended approach and agreed approach. And it consists, as you might remember from the guidance last year, uh, in RPM, we set up only one um, coordination entity called protection, uh, one field cluster, and the framework of the clusters um, uh, and ARs will be associated to this entity. But then we will have multiple global sectors. The global sector is just the denomination that, that the system use. Uh, associated to that coordination entity. And this will be uh, with the labels that you see here. Um, and this will include, will allow that in the projects module, uh, all the project owners can submit projects to this single field cluster called protection, but then divide all the uh, requirements by um, the subsectors of subsectors as mentioned above. Uh, and this will later allow, uh, later allow that the specific uh, requirements can be tracked either by AOR, but also for the whole cluster as a whole and show in FTS. And we are working to, to ensure that this is an, an approach that can be set up both for project and activity-based costing. Um, and they are working on, on that. So yeah, just to finish, uh, I think the, the last point, uh, I think was also mentioned in the introduction message, we also need to focus on, uh, well, I think one of the key messages to focus not so much uh, and hopefully this year not to spend too much on the discussions about the pain severity, but focus actually on the planning of response and we hope um, the simplify approach helps on that. And within that, some key areas of focus that we know we need to improve and uh, also working on guidance and we'll be supporting you in regarding uh, results framework, response monitoring systems, uh, targets and financial requirements, and, and greater focus on integrated program. So to finish, what you should expect very soon. At the global interagency level, the step-by-step -step guidance, the templates and timelines for HPC will be shared end of next week. That's the, that's the deadline. It will be accompanied by some uh, annex guidance, one on the joint intersector analysis framework, which will be the second part of the webinar, but also other ones, which uh, one in risk analysis and, and projections, one on prioritization and targeting, and one on monitoring. The one on monitoring is a bit delayed. And then there is also um, the plan to develop interagency uh, or update interagency guidance on costing methodologies and HPC tools management that might come later in the year. And from our side, we will be um, uh, sharing with you based on uh, the key elements that we are discussing today, but more uh, technical details also, a sectoral guidance for HNOs um, al aligned to the joint intersectoral also um, uh, part. This will also happen as uh, in mid-July. And then we'll be working on the sectoral guidance for HRPs, but concretely the key recommendations, but also specific guidance on the areas we were just discussing, targeting, costing, response frames. Uh, and then uh, schedule additional technical webinars. As you know, as part of the Protection Forum, uh, there are several events planned for uh, September mostly, but also in other months of the year. And we will consider and we'll be uh, glad to hear from you what will be the need for additional dedicated thematic webinars, maybe uh, a more dedicated webinar on uh, pin calculations, more in detail, etc. So please do let us know. So with this, I finish and open for, yeah, a quick discussion. Uh, uh, yeah, we, uh, no, we have... Um, 20, 25 minutes for this on, um, yeah, any questions you might have on the different points that we have raised um, in the first part, 
uh, whether yeah, there are any other challenges or key areas that you think we need to also focus, including the guidance uh, or uh, be aware of in terms of global support and yeah, any other um, practices or, or lessons learned from last year that you want to highlight with um, with us and with everyone else. So open for um, yeah for your contributions, please feel free to unmute. But also if you can raise your hand, I'm happy to to do that. I think I see already one. Uh, Samira, good morning and go ahead. Good morning, Ivan. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is about the inclusion of disability persons. Um, it's great actually that we have this discussion because that's an ongoing discussion for us in Afghanistan given the number of people with disability. And it was mentioned in the previous and the current uh, HRP, uh, HNO and HRP, but um, the question is how um, in practice we can actually make sure that are included. Obviously with partners doing uh, you know, general protection or IPS, IPA, uh, uh, people with disability are targeted and part of the criteria for, you know, identifying vulnerable households, uh, etc. But in it, given that we still get the question, you know, like how we make sure or um, specifically targeting people with disability, given that they have varying needs also, so it's not one kind of disability, obviously. I'm wondering in practice how we can make sure that this is the case. Uh, of course, there are there have been assessments. Um, also, that's a, 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 a bit of a challenge, as uh, our colleague mentioned, because um, not all organizations, it's um, unless they're working specifically with dis uh, people with disability, are doing specific um, assessment on this. Unfortunately, we have that now in Afghanistan. So my basic question is how, in practice, we could. Uh, I mean, besides what we're already doing, you know, in protection activities and response to um, make sure that, you know, people with disabilities specifically are there. Like, what are the, uh, in your experiences, um, what are the lessons learned and how this is possible? Thanks a lot. Uh, thank maybe, you very much. May, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think that will be a question for you, Ahmed, but maybe Hi. we take a, a few and to see if they're uh, also related. I see Claudia also raising the, uh, her hand. Go ahead, Claudia. Hi, yeah, thank you. Uh, and sorry if I didn't catch it during the presentation. I think from uh, one question is in terms of the additional guidance and support from the GPC, primarily in terms of the calculation of the PIN based on key eye assessment. Because this, we even we discussed also in the past, here in Iraq, of course, this year, because of access and COVID-related movement restriction, um, the, the um, countrywide assessment will be conducted through uh, key informants. So then it kind of affects the calculation of the PIN as we move uh, ahead with the process. So if some guidance could come on that particular topic, would be appreciated. Over. Thanks a lot, Claudia. Uh, any other questions? Or well, maybe we start. Um, go ahead, um, Ahmed. Maybe with the with the question on on disability. I think, and okay. anyone else who wants to join, contribute. Go ahead. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is a very important question, and Afghanistan specifically have a, a very um, um, a very unique situation. First, because they already have done a very good job last year in including the HNO, HRB disability inside the document itself. Although also also it's uh, also is a challenge to achieve or to transfer this uh, what is written in the HNO, HRB to reality on the ground. And we all know it's not only related disability to nearly everything we wrote in this document is always a challenge to, to achieve it on the ground in reality. Um, Afghanistan also in a very good situation because they already have a very uh, robust uh, analysis of disabilities that have been done over years and re very recently after maybe one month ago or even less there was a model disability survey that have been issued all over Afghanistan and it was massive. I never see something like that happen in a humanitarian context so we have a huge number or a huge amount of data about personal disability. 
So how we do, how we grasp that and to transfer it to practical and even in other country when there are no enough data, how we can do that? I will advise, of course, there are a lot in, in the tip sheet and the guideline, but I will advise three main things. First, ensure that you include disability in your need overview and risk analysis. Uh, joint, um, 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 uh, our joint uh, intersectoral analysis framework should include disability, should uh, be able to capture how the framework is applied to personal disability. Having this kind of analysis and understanding is the halfway because most of the time we don't understand the needs and the, the risk that is faced person's ability, as you said, they are a very diverse group um, in good way unless we do that. This is one. The second, consult person with disability. They are expert in this in their situation. They know exactly what they need. So be sure that you are able to reach to person's ability, the, their uh, help group, their uh, organization that is representing them, uh, community leaders that is having a good connection with them in order and try to diverse also your uh, richness to them, woman, different age, different gender, different categories of the community or different sect um, uh, race. All that to ensure that you grasp their need and risk and most of the time you can get a very, very insightful advice how to include them from them directly. This is second and third and most importantly, when we design our protection services, we should either it's a, a current services or service or support or response that we will design, we should ask ourselves if we design it in the way that is able to everyone to access or not the, the concept of universal design, uh, can they access it or not? Even if we cannot answer this question from technical preview, just asking the people themselves, you will understand the request or how to happen. Also analyzing, depending on the result of the last year HRB monitoring framework to see how many of disaggregated bin a uh, person in a uh, people population in need uh, because mo in Afghanistan and most of the country have disaggregated most of the their targeted group by disability. So uh, recheck again if we have achieved what, what we promised in HRB based on our monitoring framework and uh, trying to have an community or at um, interagency and intersectoral uh, um, uh, discussion about how we can improve this number is also a very important uh, point. So it's a very fast, I know there are a lot of very detailed inside, but of course the, um, uh, the guidelines and different document could answer some of it. And of course we can have a different uh, discussion. Uh, just to very quickly to announce that we will have in 21 of, uh, of uh, July this month, uh, a training ab about including disability inclusion in HNO HRP. It will be announced through OCHA because it's um, it's um, joint inter um, between advisory group UNICEF and OCHA. OCHA will announce it, will announce the date and the registration in next week, in the beginning of next week. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, before going to uh, coming back to Claudia, question and then Maria, I think you were also echoing that. Just if anyone else from uh, the other colleagues wanted to complement or on this part about disability. No, OK, good. Um, so Claudia and Marie, this, yeah, we'll, we'll go back to this on the second on the second part of the of the webinar on, on the yeah, HNO uh, guidance, but just as an advance. Indeed, that has been one of the key points, um, particularly since the start of COVID that Global Cluster had been um, bringing up to the attention uh, in the discussion about the JAF, which is uh, expected to be the guidance framework uh, uh, for the HNOs. Um, and since the beginning, there was a uh, uh, worry that the framework was highly reliable on household level data, which will be uh, even more difficult to collect this year, but also that it shouldn't be the only source. So I think that method has been, um, um, yeah, let's say, as agreed by all the actors and uh, in the guidance and in the structure of the YAF, 
both household level and area based level data now have equal importance. Um, and we know that probably there will be a need that uh, most of the indicators that will fit into the analysis will be at area based level, key informants or secondary data sources. So there is uh, that's included and mainstream, and there is also two two methods that are being proposed in the guidance to to do the analysis. One, if most of your data comes from from a large um, household level assessment, but second, which we know will be the the most realistic one, uh, to combine multiple sources, multiple uh, units of analysis um, to to conduct the analysis. So we'll touch upon that in the in the in the second part of the of the presentation uh, and please do raise any any further questions during then. Uh, Ilona, I see also you have uh, your hand raised. Go ahead, please. Thank you. So it's, it's a partial comment or question and maybe it applies more to the second part, but due to the fact that it was mentioned in all of the opening remarks, um, it's to highlight, thank you so much, um, for this, this has been very helpful so far, and I'm sure the second part will also be helpful um, to highlight like some lessons learned a little bit from last year's South Sudan. I think one of the key issues that we definitely faced was about PIN, and of course, in the future, we look forward to the further discussions that will take place on that. And then second, about, um, I mean, like, like centrality of protection. I think that we faced certain challenges and maybe yes this was more in the hno side um with getting the buy-in of the the extent to which protection should be a factor in the analysis part and i think that we can first of all we did a significant amount of advocacy at our level however at the same time i think we can also endeavor to come with even more of a robust analysis this time uh, to make sure that nobody can overlook and disagree with it. However, food insecurity, for example, um, co you know, dominated the landscape in certain ways, and then this, of course, had a cascading effect downward to country-based pooled funding in terms of determining priority locations and so on. Um, and so just to kind of ask that... I mean, when we get to the guidance, the global guidance that um, would be would be, I hope, new this year. Um, how much is centrality protection going to figure in that? Is protection specifically mentioned as you know having to have a leading role um, as we in the cluster see it as fundamentally a protection crisis in South Sudan that is you know that it, that it continues to be that from the beginning and. We face some issues with getting buy-in for that um, that analysis, and so it would be helpful to know what, if any, support or backup is coming from the global side on that. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Ilona. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, more, we'll cover that on the on the second part. Uh, but indeed, I think with the central protection, as we will. Uh, go through to you. We also see um, for this year the recommended approach that have been integrated in, into the JAFIS to ensure the, pro the analysis of protection risk violations is central first to identification and prioritization of affected areas and groups. So we avoid in these situations where um, areas more affected by displacement, conflict, etc. are deprioritized because of the complicated or uh, then methods to calculate PIN, to combine needs, etc., uh, and depending on where do you have more or less data. So that's that's the whole the, the proposed approach. Uh, hoping also that will serve to to correct some of the issues that we saw, as you were mentioning, South Sudan, but I took uh, also in other countries where um, yeah, um, the the prioritization of uh, areas affected uh, by protection risks was was not reflected necessarily in. Uh, in, uh, in the intersectoral uh, analysis and intersectoral response. So hopefully, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll cover that in the second part, but feel free to, to add questions um, at the end of that. Um, Fanta, yes, Hello, please Ivan. go ahead, come in. Okay, thank you, uh, Ivan. Uh, just uh, one uh, important uh, question. 
uh, on the presentation, it has been, okay, Fanta from uh, GBV Visa Cluster, so Sudan, I'm working with uh, Ilona and also other colleagues. So uh, my question would be uh, on the presentation, one of the limitation or key challenge is lack of data for analysis, uh, especially when we're looking at uh, establishing the PIN and also in doing intersectoral analysis. Uh, I think that is where uh, most of the time other clusters have been really uh, dominating the landscape uh, in terms of uh, the determination, resource allocation, or even uh, other other uh, aspects. Now, given our experience of last year, as Ilona rightly indicated, uh, what are uh, the way forward in terms of uh, enhancing that data availability? Last year, we were having that challenge because we were having a lot of discussion in terms of coming up and also with a compromisation to come up with a given number of PIN for protection cluster and also the AORs uh, within the protection cluster. We're having a lot of uh, back and forth discussion, but what would be the key chain that would have this year during the HNO uh, HRP process in terms of availability of data on protection as well as other AORs so that it can help us really, really to make a case uh, in terms of uh, uh, the discussions and also uh, evidence informed uh, analysis that is one question the other thing is uh, i think uh, it's also our observation the issue of timing uh, in most occasions would be anticipated to provide uh, certain specific activities during the entire process and the time interval that we are anticipated to do is really short. And when we talk about engagement and also consultation, specifically, I'm looking at uh, colleagues or probably coordinators at the field level. Yeah. So we can say that we have engaged them, but is it really the way that we are discussing or anticipating in terms of engagement, given the, the short period of time or interval that would be given from one step to another and from one activity to another activity in the entire process. So I was looking at uh, why we really, really understand the importance and significance of engagement, but uh, how far the time allotted uh, on those sequential activities would allow is something which we need also to reflect on. Thank you, Evan. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I, again, probably we'll we'll a bit discuss a bit that on uh, on Pine more in detail in, in the second part. But is I mean you you bring up a very important point about yeah one thing is how the guidance will uh, will reflect in terms of how to analyze the data available data where do we need to contribute uh, both for the joint analysis to contribute to data but you bring up also a good point I mean how do we improve our availability of data, which for protection is always in some context difficult uh, to get or we don't have the system. So obviously uh, these two go hand in hand and with COVID is even more difficult. But um, I think this is something that, yeah, uh, we're also aware and I'm trying to work at the global level within um, the established uh, information analysis working group at the global level with all the uh, the GPC SAC members uh, and ideas of responsibilities to also start developing better uh, harmonized frameworks, better harmonized tools for the analysis, uh, the collection analysis of protection data. Uh, for this year, I think there will be uh, a bigger focus on secondary data as we were talking on uh, yeah, area based data. So data coming from protection monitoring systems, I think will be key. Um, and we're happy also to, to have a, a dedicated uh, discussions on that with operations that um, that are in yeah, we, we like some support on, on strengthening the, the data collection systems. But also in terms of, yeah, that there might be a lot of secondary data sources that we can uh, support uh, on this. Um, but yeah, let's let's also touch base on the second part and see if this answers those questions. 
Uh, and I think on the time frame, as you were mentioning, yeah, indeed, it, it is always tight sked deadlines. What we hope and one of the key messages uh, I think we, we wanted also to share is we know usually months go, weeks and months into the discussion on HPN, HNO and PIN and severity and recalculate and disaggregate. We hope for this year and are advocating that this is simplified as much as possible. Uh, and we focus on the joint analysis, on the joint discussions with partners, with experts, and on the planning of the response, how that fits into that. So that is one key message. The timeline will be even tighter this year, unfortunately, because obviously HPC usually starts in April, let's say. Now we're obviously in July, and only now the global guidance, the global templates will be out. Uh, but again, we hope that the simplify approach, um, but I think this is something that we will consider also when developing the sectoral guidance, recommended um, steps and time frame for consultations uh, and for the different steps. So, so good point and we'll take it into account. Um, I don't know if uh, I seen another question here. How do you find need for protection so as to come with the pin? We'll cover that in the second part. Um, so I'll, I'll park that question, but have it here um, and we'll refer to that. So I don't know if there are any other uh, yeah, key questions related to key challenges or um, yeah, the key messages about the HPC or any other contribution that colleagues from the OPSEL or AORs want to add at this point. Um, but other than that, maybe we can do a short break as a schedule. Uh, but yeah, I'll give one minute or one, yeah few seconds just to see if there are any other hands raised or questions in the chat box. OK, so our colleagues, anyone else wants to contribute? No. OK, so if, if OK, yeah, sorry, someone wanted to speak. Yeah, if, Ivan, it's Michael. Can you hear Hi, me? Mike. Yes, we can hear Hi. you. Well, yeah, yeah. And thanks everyone for the questions. I think we can later for the second session, but also as we're wrapping up, it sounds like there's a lot of discussion as you raised, Ivan, the equivalency of the secondary data, uh, prevalence data, expert judgment, and, and we can look at a few examples because it sounds like from the questions in South Sudan, we need to support um, colleagues in, in emphasizing the validity of those data sources and how they're relevant uh, for protection, so maybe we can spend. And I'm happy to happy to come in second session with some specific examples around food security, for example. Excellent, Michael. Thanks a lot, and um, we'll um, yeah we'll call upon uh, you on that session also, and we can um, discuss. Um, okay, so let's do a very a short break. Let's use five minutes just to stretch the legs, have a coffee, and we'll go into the HNO. Um, I'll hope the, the presentation will be short and we have, I think, uh, enough time for discussions. So I see there are quite a lot of questions about the PIN, the data sources, etc. So, so we'll leave enough time for that. So don't disconnect. Just go for a coffee or a stretch your legs or a tea or, and uh, let's say we restart at 11.06 uh, Geneva time, so in five minutes. Thanks, colleagues.
Hello everyone. Just confirm me you can hear me well. If anyone, William or Michael. <laughs> Loud and, clear, loud and clear. Thanks, William. Okay, hope uh, you managed to recharge the energies and let's go ahead with the discussion, which, yeah, as mentioned, we already understand this is um, one of the key issues um, around the whole HPC cycle, the being a severity, prioritization discussions. Let me share back. I think I'm not sharing. OK. Uh, so <clears> HNO <throat> guidance, the key, what we want to discuss today is key elements and approach um, for this year intersectoral and sectoral analysis. Um, as discussed with you, these guidances are still uh, on the making and able to uh, aim to finish uh, soon, so we also want to hear from you today. Yeah, whether any other key areas or aspects that you think need to be included or uh, particularly focused, uh, particularly if we haven't thought about it, that we we have the time to integrate it. So try to do a quick presentation so we can focus more on the discussion. So yeah, as you are aware, the last uh, one of the key areas that wanted to be strengthened with the enhanced HPC approach um, from 2020 and onwards was um, um, improve intersectoral analysis of needs and improve intersectoral uh, response uh, and prioritization. Uh, last year, uh, without going too much in the details, but um, yeah, some of you are aware of, of this, um, the idea was that the HPC uh, and particularly the HNO uh, was informed by what uh, has been called the Joint Intersector or Joint Interagency Analysis Framework, the JAF, which is an initiative that has been um, been um, on discussion for more than three years now, I think, since 2000, late 2016 onwards, um, which is yeah a framework uh, that will be uh, being discussed by global clusters, OCHA, donors, uh, and other key agent, lead agencies and other partners um, as an overall framework to guide joint analysis, joint assessments in the field. Uh, and obviously one of its key um, outcomes will be also to inform HNOs. Last year, the framework was not finalized. Uh, there were discussions ongoing. There were some e topics where uh, there was not yet agreement or uh, technical development yet, but uh, some elements of it were introduced in the HNO templates, um, which was part of, of the confusions and challenges from, from last year. Um, because first, not all the guidance was not finalized, so the, 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 the framework and some of the components were integrated, but without necessarily having the guidance. And then there was also some uh, confusion guidance on the severity and pin analysis that we know. So the idea since last year was to yeah, continue the work and development of the YAF to get a consensus among all the actors to develop and clarify the issues that uh, all, uh, we and other clusters uh, consider that were missing from, from the framework and included in the uh, in yeah, develop a, a specific guidance and then properly included in the in the HNOs. That the idea was also that this was completed much earlier. That the framework would be tested first in some pilot countries, uh, adapted, validated, and then make it into the into the HNO. This has not happened. The discussion have been uh, delayed and continues because of different, again, conceptual technical issues, but also the delays that COVID-19 had uh, implied. So at the moment, discussions are still ongoing. They have been progressing significantly in recent weeks, and the idea is to finish the guidance for, um, as, as I was mentioning to you, on mid, uh, for mid next week. We, and together with all the other clusters, have called for a simplified approach again for this year, uh, the keyword. 
uh, for today. And that meant also we have been requesting that the elements of the framework that have not been or were the remaining con issues were uh, park and simplify for this year. Um, but also from our perspective, one of the key issues is how to reflect properly the central protection. So the framework con uh, concretely is the one that you see now here. It's a framework that has four main pillars the context, the shocks, and the impacts um, of the crisis, um, and then um, the shocks and the impact translate into what the framework calls humanitarian conditions, which in the HNO template was um, humanitarian consequences, uh, that are the outcomes that is creating on uh, the population and is the main source for the analysis of severity of needs and pin calculation. One of the issues with the framework first is that it was the discussion was concentrated a lot about this last pillar, the humanitarian conditions one, uh, because obviously it was the one where um, uh, severity and pin calculations um, uh, were uh, being uh, discussed, and a bit on uh, the, the context shocks impact pillars were being a bit left behind of yeah what concretely should be should be the analysis in that area. What is the purpose of use within the whole framework of these three pillars? From a protection perspective, uh, one of the issues we saw from the beginning and we've been advocating with the framework is also how the central of protection is properly integrated in the framework. Um, at the, uh, initially, in last yeah, previous discussions, the idea is that the humanitarian conditions pillars were uh, as you have, as you see, have specific sub pillars to uh, kind of classify the different type of outcomes on the population. So the outcomes on physical and mental well-being, the outcomes in terms of living standards, access to basic needs of services, and the outcomes it has on uh, coping mechanisms or the consequence the crisis has on, on coping mechanisms, be the positive or negative. And all the sectors were supposed to contribute or are supposed to contribute with indicators into this sub pillars to then have a joint analysis of, of all those indicators and information and see where there are the um, um, concurrence of different needs what is the severity of those needs from uh, yeah in a scale uh, from one to five um, and then protection obviously was a, a, a sector contributing to that but then it was yeah as an, uh, any other sector it was just a disaggregation of the framework but that didn't ensure the centrality of protection in the analysis. Uh, and as I think we already were anticipating the previous discussion, um, yeah, when it comes to, to indicators, the framework for this pillar was also at the beginning prioritizing or giving more weight to household level indicators, which are obviously important, but yes, um, that meant that um, some of those indicators or some of the other sectors could have a a bigger impact in the in the analysis of severity and protection concerns will be diluted or deprioritized. So for this year, what we have been focusing and recommending is first that the centrality of protection is properly integrated and squarely integrated in the framework from the beginning. That means in the context shocks and impacts analysis, which is the ones that should define the priority affected areas that the humanitarian response should focus on and what are the specific affected population groups and what are the specific vulnerable groups that are having impacts because of those shocks and drivers and context of the crisis. So this is the baseline. They should be the baseline and setting the scope of the analysis and then the, the analysis of the intersectorality of needs uh, and the severity of those needs will happen. So this is what we have been um, basically proposing this this year. Concretely, that um, there is now a concrete step and guidance that we have been contributing to the JAF on how the context shocks impasse analysis um, will be used to identify the priority affected areas, the priority affected groups of the of the uh, yeah, humanitarian analysis and then humanitarian response, which is uh, was already included in the HNO template last year. Is that section 
there was an initial three sections uh, called context, shocks, impact, and then all of that should produce the scope of analysis. Uh, but there was no guidance or yeah, it was only mostly used to put some narrative content, but it didn't have a, a cross-cutting um, impact or, or use in the whole framework. So what we're suggesting concretely this year is that that should be a specific uh, analysis that should place centrality of protection as a core element together with other uh, key, um, key cross-cutting issues. So um, the guidance concretely, and we'll go a bit more in detail, um, specifies how to um, analyze multiple uh, information at different levels of, uh, and different sources of data, fully or uh, concretely informed by protection risk, protection violations, to define that scope of the analysis. Then the protection indicators, as, uh, as well as other uh, in, um, sectoral indicators, will fit into the different intersectoral uh, subpillars of humanitarian consequences. Last year, as you all uh, remember, because centrality of protection was not properly integrated in the framework, um, to ensure at least some visibility uh, for protection, uh, in the HNO templates, there was included a fourth subpillar that was never part of the, the, let's say, the discussions of the YAF, but it was only in the HNO for protection. Um, so it was living standard, physical well-being, protection, and actually coping mechanism was called resilience in the HNO template. Um, and the idea was that the protection, that protection pillar, was the responsibility of the protection cluster and AORs to jointly uh, produce the analysis of the severity and pin that should be equal to the one for the sectoral pin, um, but also in consultation with other clusters to make sure that we uh, have visibility. But at the same time, the guidance also was asking to contribute the same indicators and divide them into the other two pillars. Why? Because the confusing guidance was that um, the living standards and particularly the physical mental well-being subpillars will have priority over the, the calculations of intersectoral pain and intersectoral severity. Um, so yes, if protection was not contributing to this, where uh, we were yeah, uh, risking uh, being deprioritized. So what that resulted was is basically that each operation had to interpret this confusing or mixed guidance from uh, particularly one that, that OCHA released last year um, in different manners, and we saw that the HNOs had three or four uh, different approaches. Some use the four pillars, others use only three, others use uh, only two physical and mental well-being uh, living standards. But it also meant that for the uh, HRP, it was confusing why we, why we had four pins for different pins, or three or two in some cases, how then will targets be associated, funding, etc. So it created a lot of confusion. So for this year, the recommendation that has been agreed is that we will only have one intersectoral pin. So the subpillars will be only for classifying information uh, and organizing the analysis, but the main outcome of the framework will be one intersectoral pin. But the first step, as mentioned, will be also the first the identification across all the sectors largely informed by protection, uh, the central protection of uh, affected areas and affected groups. And the other two considerations that the intersector analysis um, is, is also considering uh, on the guidance and uh, the discussions that we and other clusters have been uh, bringing forward is, first, there was also um, a concern, as I mentioned before, that the analysis of the severity of needs and humanitarian conditions was mostly prioritizing, or at least that was understood as a message, household level indicators, needs as based indicators, and not giving enough or the same priority to area based indicators, to risk or proxy indicators that for protection are, are quite important. Um, and for this year, not only, I mean, for any year, combining multiple sources of data is always uh, appropriate, but for this year, the difficulties of having household level data uh, call for a simplified approach. So for this year, uh, the guidance has two scenarios, but we know and we are pushing that there is more focus on the uh, what is called a scenario B, 
which is a scenario where um, we have mostly data from different sources uh, at different levels of analysis, both household, but also mainly area based in, uh, data, such as the one that we collected through key informant interviews, the one that is collected through secondary sources, monitoring systems, uh, information systems, etc., or, or official sources. Um, and the last part is that the sectoral intersectoral analysis is now integrating better, although it needs more development, the analysis of risks uh, in the whole framework. So, concretely, the first step, as mentioned, for, for the joint intersectoral analysis will be setting the scope of the analysis. This will mean consolidating information related to the context, the shocks and impacts. Again, with a strong focus on protection, risks, and violations, so the active role of the clusters and AORs will be key in this process to establish the scope of the analysis, the uh, affected areas and affected vulnerable groups of the humanitarian crisis. Uh, as mentioned, this is what was already included in the channel templates, although it was not systematically used. Uh, here, a couple of examples is identifying what are the population groups and what are the areas uh, that should be priority. And then this should have a concrete link to uh, the humanitarian uh, conditions analysis. Among the benefits, I mean, I think uh, the idea is to ensure decentralized protection and cross cutting issues inform um, the intersect analysis in a more central manner. Um, uh, that there is a sequential linkage between the first analysis of context shocks and impacts and then the analysis of humanitarian conditions and not only go straight into the analysis of needs and yeah, without uh, any context um, uh, analysis also informing that. That this is the baseline that all clusters or partners and agencies agreed for the uh, scope of the analysis and also baseline figure of affected areas and groups that will then be the reference to calculating PIN. Um, and uh, yeah, other key, I think, advantages of value added will be to ensure there is joint analysis interpretation from the beginning of the process. Um, I think that was other of the key limitations we saw from the JAF. It seems to be more about a mathematical or technical process of just giving indicators. There will be some formulas to produce an intersectoral severity and sectoral pin. And there was a lack of the joint analysis interpretation that should happen in, in these type of processes where all the clusters experts review the information, contextualize it, uh, and, ad, and, and adjust uh, what the information is telling you. Um, and also helps to be the baseline with um, humanitarian development or triple nexus analysis, um, because this analysis can also help identify what are concretely the areas, groups most affected by the humanitarian crisis, mostly should be prioritized for humanitarian assistance, what might be also other groups, other areas where the linkage with development actors will be more important. Um, but to avoid trying to dump all the needs, all the issues in uh, HRP, um, and yeah, deprioritizing some concretely humanitarian and, and protection responses uh, in the process. So how concretely, uh, and I'll try to move faster now, uh, some four concrete steps to do this intersectoral uh, analysis of context shocks impacts, identify context adaptive indicate context specific indicators that will be available for the same geographical units of analysis that has been decided. This will include indicators related to the context, but particularly to the exposure of the population to shock and risks. So here is where we will be able to, to contribute with indicators about conflict, violence, human rights violations, but also other, other shock type of indicators such as natural hazards or disease outbreaks. Um, indicators also related to the impact of the crisis in the affected population, displacement, mobility, impact on disruptment of services or systems, uh, and impact also related to the lack or gaps in access to humanitarian access to certain areas or groups. And it will also focus on key vulnerability criteria that have differentiated uh, impacts on the population uh, as we were discussing. These indicators can be context analyzed based on a, con uh, on a contextual base, meaning that um, the clusters and the JAF team will help to analyze yeah, how to classify the different indicators, 
some might be bin binary. I don't know, uh, lack of um, lack of access to humanitarian access. Some could be based on threshold or on ranges. So this will depend on context uh, on a context by context base, which is also hope, uh, something that we hope simplifies the consideration of protection indicators that. In the GIAF, we have been having this issue, and I think you had it also uh, at the field level where you were uh, having this reply that this indicator doesn't fit in the metering condition because you cannot have a universal threshold or it's not an indicator measuring needs. Um, so this is uh, also uh, how to, to, to make sure that these indicators are used for the whole intersector analysis. And then a process of joint interpretation analysis of the results. So this will not be just a mathematical formula of producing this is the combination indicator. This is the area of factors, but actually this is where um, the, the joint analysis among all the cluster sectors experts will will be key. And the final step will be once to ident identify those affected areas, priority affected areas by the crisis to profile what are the most affected groups. Uh, both referring to the categories of the humanitarian profile guidance, but also ensuring that key vulnerable groups that might be varied context by context are, are particularly identified. For the severity analysis and pin calculations at the intersectoral level, so the idea is, as I was mentioning, there will be only one analysis of an intersectoral pin. The sectors will contribute with indicators to the different pillars. There has been a work on revising the list of indicators based on the ones you use in the HNOs that are most available and that are recommended as core indicators, but also some others that sometimes can, can help us proxy. And as I was mentioning, I think this was responding also to, to other uh, two questions uh, um, in the previous section. Both household and area-based indicators are considered equally to inform this. Um, so it's not only that this indicator needs to come from household level assessment, also key informal and secondary data sources um, that uh, produce indicators related to the needs of the population will be integrated in this analysis. So the, from our side, um, some key recommendations on this. Focus should not only be on these complex or sometimes technical discussions about indicators, pin, etc., but also on the narrative. It's important that the central decision is included, and I think that was already well covered in last year HNOs, and, uh, and it should also be reinforced this year in the whole intersectoral chapters of the narrative, in the context of crisis impacts, and in the intersectoral pillars as well. And finally, when it comes to the sectoral analysis, we are not expecting um, uh, or not introducing significant changes this year. It's just harmonizing and building upon what you use and what recommended for last year. So the sector analysis will also start with identifying the information available, the, the different indicators, which will be ideally the same that were contributed for the intersector analysis, both for context and humanitarian conditions or others that didn't make it or were not accepted for one reason or the other in the analysis, but are important for the protection sector analysis. Um, as mentioned, there has been a revised list of indicator and threshold, some country adaptations, and we are uh, um, ready to support you during the process to adapt uh, those. Then we will do, as last year, a joint analysis across the clusters and AORs of the joint overarching, what we were calling last year, overarching severity scale, and also then specific ones. Um, and then that severity scale will be the baseline and also be on the, uh, based on the figures of affected groups to derive the PIN calculations, um, both for the main affected population groups, but also the, the vulnerable groups. So the idea is to link these two together, as many of the operations did last year, but this year we want to be more uh, have a more harmonized approach so have some recommended benchmarks or um, uh, suggested percentages of depending on the severity score what will be the percentage of population in need um, to apply based on affected groups and vulnerable groups indicators so to finalize yeah the, the key recommendations for this year is to ensure um, use of multiple sources secondary data review will be key um, if 
there is a possibility and there is availability of household level data. Obviously, that's quite important, um, but any other sources also of area based data will be uh, key. Um, a strong focus and strong leadership and engagement to the process of identifying the priority areas and population groups. Also, a recommendation again, uh, we hope that this year the simplify approach, but we're also ready to support with advocacy and with the uh, yeah, uh, consultation and communication with you that not get stuck and not lose so much time as we uh, had to go year after year in discussion at the intersectoral level about the mathematical pin calculations, but focus also on the joint analysis on the, what it goes in the narrative sections and also the focus on highlighting the uh, groups with the specific needs um, specific to each context. So I'll finish here um, just with a with a quick um, yeah this quick um, um, presentation um, and um, open again for the discussion. I think we already have some of the questions from from the previous session that we can bring um, uh, or start to the analysis. Uh, but maybe I'll, uh, I'll before open for questions from everyone. Um, we'll give the word to to the other colleagues from Opsel or, or AORs to to complement. Um, uh, Michael, I know you wanted to to add a few specific points, so maybe over to you and then to any other colleague that want to complement. Thanks, Ivan. Can you hear me okay? Yes, very well. Great. And and colleagues, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Michael. Copland. I'm with the Child Protection AOR uh, globally. So maybe just a few specific uh, thoughts and, and thanks to, to Ivan uh, for working so well with all of the AORs and fighting um, for the protection specificity. So colleagues, Ivan mentioned that equivalency of, of using different data sources. And I think it's important at country level to articulate and advocate why that's important and and not just because those other data sources are valid, but also, as you know, uh, trying to collect at household level around issues of abuse, exploitation and rights violations is both unsafe, unethical uh, and often not effective uh, in terms of in terms of accuracy. So I think we we as Ivan's saying, we're also ready to to support you with with that argument. You shouldn't have to be arguing the case because that kind of mixed method approach is is accepted now. But I think it's important to 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 stress um, the reasons we wouldn't be be promoting that. And I know for child protection, but also for GBV and and others um, that would hold. So a few thoughts on and some examples on on what we could use. And picking up on the comments around the risk that we're going to end up with a narrative that's dominated, um, for example, by by food insecurity, um, and that we may go backwards in terms of not seeing protection as central, but seeing it as secondary or tertiary. And I want to highlight uh, information that is collected by food security colleagues around coping mechanisms. We see in some countries that protection uses this data for analysis and in others we don't. Um, so this requires us to become familiar with what food security colleagues are collecting and also to become comfortable in using that as a direct source um, for coping mechanisms and the coping mechanisms would include things like child labour, forced and early marriage for example, but these are very useful proxies for other um, other risks. So we're able to support you with that. And one of the questions Ivan has posed is, do we have good practices? And we've got a, a, a colleague on the line, Boris Ariston, who's working with the Child Protection AOR and Global Protection Cluster. And we do have good examples um, from the Sahel and more coming about how we can cooperate with food security to use that data, which helps us given their, their footprint um, to make use of their data, but also to ensure that the narrative isn't only on food security, because we know those coping, um, what are called negative coping mechanisms, don't come later. They actually start early. 
And we've also got information from previous years on those coping mechanisms. So again, making making use of, of, of that data. The second example I wanted to give is that we know from the World Health Organization, um, based on research, the levels of, of mental health conditions that populations will suffer, suffer when they're exposed to violence and conflict. Um, that's, that's researched, it's known. Um, so again, uh, where we don't have administrative data from Ministry of Health and others, we're not going to be able to, and nor should we be going household by household to, to try and assess levels of depression, suicidality and so on. So we should be using this, this data um, to estimate. That's why the research has been done. The numbers are incredibly high. So as William said, we've got a collective responsibility to look at cross-cutting issues such as mental mental health. The data tells us up to 20% of any given population will suffer mental health conditions. So these are these are mental health conditions that require uh, a response. The last, and again, we're, we're, we'll, we'll talk at the end about how you can get support and where to go, but we're, we're able to support you with access to the information and to support you on how how to use it. The last point I wanted to make, and it's linked with the discussion on disability and, and issues that um, cut across many sectors, and, and it's it's about the intersectoral planning and the and the costing as well as working on the pin calculation. And that's the role uh, within protection, including the AORs around case management. Uh, so there may be a situation where parts of protection are taking the lead on case management, but being clear around the calculation, but also the costing and so on, where different sectors play play a role in that planning. So again, the, the need to work uh, with other other sectors. I'm going to stop stop there and uh, go back to you, uh, Ivan. Thanks. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you very much, Michael, for, for those very useful examples. Um, so, yeah, maybe just to hear from you now, colleagues, uh, maybe I call upon also Ilona, Fanta, Claudia and Marie, you were uh, raising some points related to to the challenges from last year um, for prioritization, for pre calculations, plus the additional ones um, because of yeah uh, the focus on key informant interviews and how they didn't or they didn't fit the, the framework so yeah wanted to hear from you whether you think uh, yeah you consider the, the proposed approach the recommendations are uh, are in line with, with what you will expect for this year or something more that you will need uh you want us to to bring uh, attention here at global level discussion so yeah i don't know if um who wants to take the the floor first Hi, Hi, even this is. Uh, please go ahead. I don't know who's speaking. Or maybe uh, it's me with the echo. Sorry. Go ahead, Claudia. I think. Um, so I, okay. So I think that the um, there are still a couple of questions that needs to be answered in terms of, uh, of course, as you said. I mean, it's it's much better than last year because also the. Uh, beginning of you know the the first um, time that we had this uh, enhanced HPC and so on and so forth. So I think that also in country in Iraq, we we are coming to a better understanding of this new uh, streamlined process. Um, the guidance on the calculation of the pin through KI, which is going to be also a mix of households uh, level data, because in camps in Iraq, we will still go ahead with the household level data collection. Um, it's something that we can explore together with the assessment working group and OCHA and your support um, along the line as we move ahead. One question which I have is still in terms of this um, uh, clarification of having just, uh, uh, you know, not having protection as humanitarian consequence anymore. Uh, whether we, the protection intervention, the protection activities will automatically still fall under the two uh, that we had last year, whether it is uh, physical uh, and mental well-being or and living standards. Because as you might recall from last year conversation, especially for Iraq operation and the protection cluster, 
it was a bit of a back and forth with OCHA, whether we would put some of the, our key activities, in particular legal assistance and the uh, well-being, whether we would put it under living standard, whether you know putting under the protection humanitarian consequence would indeed be excluded automatically. So as long as there is clarity, and that comes from the global level of uh, the indicators where they fall, where the activities fall, I think it's uh, it, it should be straightforward this year. Remembering, as I said, that last year for us was uh, particularly challenging to the point that we had to go to ask William and yourself to jump in in discussion with OCHA globally. Um, so this year hopefully it will be smoother, but still some more guidance in terms of what is expected, what are the discussion happening in Geneva or New York or wherever would certainly be beneficial in the country operation. When we also know that uh, there might be different pushes or different elements coming into play in different uh, in different operation. In Iraq, it's uh, it's been an example in the past. Nothing more from my side. I think it's maybe other colleagues have some other elements to add, but for us, it's the issue of having clarity on, on the way forward, especially for the activities and humanitarian consequences. Over. Thanks a lot, Claudia. Just to confirm and have it clear, uh, you're, you're talking mostly also about how then the humanitarian consequence was also translated into the HRP and uh, then have a penal software consequence to attach your targets and your activities. It was mostly on that, right? Yeah, it was mostly on that because uh, at the beginning we, we delayed the whole process in Iraq for, um, I think, over a month uh, beyond the expected submission or definition of the way forward because of this unclarity. So then if basically for us, it was then re bringing up the conversation again where the protection should have then in the HRP a separate pin as a separate humanitarian consequence, which eventually it was decided at the HCT to have it just as a centrality of protection, political or, or like obvious statement linked to the HCT protection strategy. So this year for us, it's clearer, but still I think that this type of conversation and this level of clarity needs to be uh, conveyed to all the country operation, because as I said, there might be colleagues who have uh, difficulties in uh, in having that clarified uh, from the beginning. Over. Thanks, Claudia. Um, yeah, I'll come back to that, but also wanted to give the chance to the other colleagues that already raised hands. So I have Ilona and then Eri and then Boris. I just see his hand. So Ilona, go ahead. Ask the same question that I or issue that I posed previously, but to give a follow up to it in response or in connection with Michael's comments that, of course, definitely um, these areas like VAM, mental health related data are absolutely great opportunities for protection, you know, further analysis. And I think that what ended up happening, if I'm not wrong, but anyone can correct me last time was more that the other sectors kind of more holding the pen on this data were incorporating it. However, then the perception was there that this is enough protection analysis. And this then leads to the challenges that had been highlighted there that I previously highlighted as well. So that um, definitely, you know, I do think it can be like, let's, let's from our side, we will definitely pay more attention, I think, on trying to um, put a, you know, our own analysis on similar data or that data. And at the same time, yes, I think the issue goes back to certain buy-in on what, ex you know, the extent of involvement of protection um, in the analysis and how much of a leading role um, that protection has. And then if I can pose another question about population groups, um, is it possible to just clarify whether there'll be population group disaggregation not, or if there's anything that can be said on that. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Ilona. Uh, Eri, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm Eri, uh, GPP subsector coordinator from Myanmar. 
So mine is more like a request for support rather than question. Um, so in the context of Myanmar, one of the biggest challenges that we are facing um, is like a lack of available data. And uh, yeah, I think overall doing any assessment or survey in Myanmar is very sensitive and it's very difficult. So we don't also have like a multi-cluster needs assessment. But then like here in today's uh, discussion, um, probably what we can do is also like a secondary data analysis and the protection cluster has a uh, yeah, protection monitoring and also like from GPP, we have some data from GPP safety audit. Uh, so it was really good to know that uh, yeah, there is something also we can do even within a uh, constrained environment. Uh, so I think, yeah, uh, we would also like to request from global team to support us uh, in the coming days uh, in terms of uh, looking at available data and then how we can utilize for this uh, HNO process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Boris, go ahead. Mr. Cardona, good morning. Do you hear me well? Loud and clear. La, eh, fantastic. So, hi everyone. Good morning, afternoon, or evening. Uh, this is Boris Aristin from the Child Protection AOR, which is at the moment somewhere between Venice and uh, Verona. So, one greetings to all the Italian colleagues that they are uh, attending the call. My, my comment is more is more a general. Uh, I have a specific feedback to one of our colleagues and uh, and also one uh, more general comment overall, which is from the questions that our uh, colleagues they are sending at the moment we can already visualize how contextualize is each of our situations how on every country we uh, we face uh, different challenges and we need to tackle them in different ways and having that into account this is the main reason why the global protection cluster and the global aors they have been working over one year to have this consolidated approach and uh, i have been working very closely and uh, often in uh, facing hard moments particularly in the discussions with otsa with ivan and the rest of the aor colleagues in order to ensure a couple of things and the, the main one is that uh, protection cluster and the global aors they have a solid approach about making their needs identification and analysis regardless of the information available and as michael was saying ensuring that we can make use of prevalence data and secondary data that can help us to make an interpretation of the protection priorities that's why we are uh, we have been working very uh, very strongly on the on the context analysis for the prioritization of the uh, most affected areas and the identification of the most affected groups so giving a kind of feedback to uh, to the colleague that was uh, making a specific question about that yes there is a categorization uh, that will be included into the dates and all, and we have the options the technical and the coordination wise options for ensuring that uh, all the categories that will be properly identified and as protection cluster requires no with all the disaggregation that is um, that is a must no and we have been postponing this discussion and this uh, objective for a long time the second point is also the strength of the uh, all the ors and the protection cluster for making this joint analysis so we have the the tools and at the same time we have the capacity for supporting you and to tailor no, the, the the different situations and the different approaches that each of the countries they will be facing no? for the child protection or we can say that uh, we have at the moment in this uh, global protection cluster uh, support operational support cell for the remote support uh, like seven people counting with the global health desk the regional health desk the regional focal points and uh, and also three people uh, working on needs identification and analysis which will continue contribute not only to the efforts of the child protection AOR, but also to the to the protection cluster um, which one it will be my main recommendation to all the colleagues is that uh, we can position ourselves saying that protections should ensure its centrality in the HTNO analysis and count with our, uh, our support during the overall cycle of the HNO and, um, and also during the HRP, you know, because one thing, uh, one process is going to be very much connected with the other. So um, it's a message of uh, motivation from my side and uh, also good spirit, but also a, a bit of sending a message of we can do it 
uh, we have the tools and approaches for making it possible, and we have the right people in the right place for making it possible. In particular, uh, Ivan for uh, his enormous support. So very much ready you know, to start the, the process, and please don't hesitate uh, directly through your focal points or directly to the uh, at global level to reach us when the, rest, uh, the processes of the HNO are starting in your respective countries and how to tackle the differences of uh, between how is the situation in Myanmar or how is the situation in Iraq. Um, Second, I would like just to give a, a very quick feedback to Michele that uh, in the chat was mentioning about uh, the situation in OPT. Just to let you know that the child protection AOR is uh, in, uh, in OPT is uh, contracting in the coming weeks. Boris, we cannot hear you. Is it me only that cannot hear what is? <laughs> no, he, he, he dropped out. Uh, I think go, okay. go ahead and we can link up uh, yeah. Mich Michelle. I think it's Michelle, not Michele. Michelle uh, with Boris and myself afterwards. Back to okay. you, Ivan. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Uh, yeah, taking notes here to do some close uh, also remarks on the different questions, but I also have Sasha and then Fant, I think, was also asking. So go ahead, Sasha, and then Fant. Um, thank you. Good afternoon, all. Um, my question is is more of a clarification um, that leads to a question. So, um, as you mentioned, I Ivan, um, the the purpose of this new guide guidance is to try and harmonize uh, what has been happening last year. And uh, you mentioned that uh, with the framework and the humanitarian conditions uh, or consequences. Um, you mentioned that in some of the operations uh, for the calculation of the intersectoral pin, um, uh, for example, for South Sudan, we only rel relied on uh, physical, mental well-being and living standards, dropping the others. Um, so what is the plan for this year? Are we using all um, the humanitarian uh, consequences for the calculation? Uh, because based on even the new ones, uh, or the changing of the names, protection would be part of all, I would presume. Um, so if you can you know, clarify and give more guidance on that, thank you. Thanks, Sasha. Copy on that. Um, Fanta, go ahead and then I'll take. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Um, uh, my question would be, uh, uh, looking at the use of secondary data, especially when we are look, uh, doing on the pin and severity analysis. Uh, for instance, looking at our experience of last year, we were using uh, some secondary data, let's say, for instance, uh, rich assessment on WASH, where for GBV specifically, we were using the distance uh, covered uh, beyond uh, uh, 30 minutes uh, as one way of indicating on increased risk to GBV and also we're looking at the IPCs, Integrated Food Security Phase Classification, IPC 3, 4, 5 and areas where the risk would be high. So those kinds of data uh, are usable because if you look at uh, the information is available for all counties or for all administrative units which would allow us comparability in terms of, you know, helping us to decide on uh, the determination of pin or severity analysis. My question is that in some instances, there are good uh, secondary data, which are more of qualitative rather than quantitative, okay? So how best can we use or how much flexibility or room is there this year uh, HNO HRP process to use some of those secondary data, uh, knowing the fact that the PN and severity analysis is heavily dependent on numeric uh, value, like uh, quantitative uh, data. That is my uh, question. I think my second question was about population group, uh, about the host community, IDP, IDP returnees, uh, refugee returnees, and IDP-like refugee returnees. I think it would be very important if we get clear guidance which population group which would be covered because I, I realize that Ilona, my colleague, has also asked it. You, you can give us more clarification on that. And then there's the, also, again, looking at our experience of last year, 
when we talk about the single intersectoral pin, uh, I recall maybe Sasha can uh, come in there, where we were asked to look at our pin because our pin was affecting either an increasing or decreasing the intersectoral pin number. So uh, how much is our, like as a PC uh, pin, should be open for fluctuation or maybe uh, adjustment while others remains as they are in order to adjust the intersectoral pin. Uh, the last question is uh, uh, even looking at William's presentation at the beginning on the first session of the webinar, uh, the maximum that we have obtained as a PC is 37% of our requirement uh, in terms of resource. Uh, again, I think uh, if we go operation by operation, I would not expect a much different trend. So uh, the resource requirement would heavily depend on the HRP and then HRP is also dependent on the pin number. So if that is the case, how, how do we reconcile the huge amount of funding gap that we are looking at globally or at operational level vis-a-vis the, the the pin the population in need number because which is ultimately affecting the HRP and then the resource requirement maybe if you can shed some light on that i would highly appreciate over to you thank you thank you very much fanta um so just before providing some comments on on several of the questions just looking if someone else wants to add a question or comment okay so thanks a lot for for the very useful uh, feedback so let me just i think yeah uh, we have covered also some on, on before but um claudia well noted um on the need to have a clear guidance on how the changes uh, in the intersectoral framework will be uh, translated and aligned and expected to be reflected in HRP and where all the different activities will go. So we'll make sure that, that is, um, there is clear uh, steady guidance on that. Uh, but also on your point and also I think on a bit unrelated to, to such as point. Um, so the idea again is that indeed all the sectors including protection for the military conditions analysis will contribute with indicators to the different sub pillars some sectors are more focused on physical mental well-being other in physical and unit standards for protection we we think there are indicators and information needs relevant for all the three to three different sub pillars including coping mechanisms but at the end the analysis will be only one single pin so that for this year the idea is that there are no Pin, meet physical and mental well-being, pin, living standards, and that these two, in addition, will not have a priority in terms of funding resources. The priority should be based on the context impact shocks analysis of most affected areas and on the intersectoral severity of needs all combined. That should be where the, where the priority analysis happens. So when it comes to HRP, the targets should be given against each of the strategic objectives that are agreed and um, so not necessarily to each of these sub pillar pins which which shouldn't no, no longer exist and this is precisely to avoid um, in cases particularly where we had a protection pin but we also contributed to the other two pillars um, that we uh, and we're not clear where to put our targets our activities in in the hrps uh, but we'll make sure um, to to ensure that is clear on on the guidance um, I think on um, there was a question from Fanta and I think on Ilona on the clarification of population groups. Um, so well noted, indeed, the idea is to focus on, first of all, the humanitarian profile guidance, which is the agreed framework and make sure those groups are profiled and identify what, which ones are having particular impacts for the crisis, not um and have that joint discussion so that will include yeah affected first affected versus not affected within the affected differentiated between displaced population and not displaced ho and within the non displaced which are and hosting po post po uh, displaced population which was are non hosting but are still affected to the different impacts of the crisis and finally yeah non displaced non affected necessarily um, and indeed, we think this probably is a good uh, and is a key element, and that's why we are giving more importance that this is a first step of the analysis. 
because we do see some operations and some cases where maybe um, sometimes groups that are not necessarily affected by the crisis, but they do have some needs that might be more related to development issues or, or to other structural issues than not to the crisis, which uh, we are there to, to respond, might get higher PIN figures of PIN, might get higher priorities. So this is a, a key element to ensure that is uh, agreed jointly and based on the analysis of the context and the impact of the crisis. But that will be the groups, first of all. So it will be referring to that guidance. So we'll make sure to, to include that, uh, that that is clear in the guidance. But then the specific vulnerable groups, um, including uh, a specific uh, sex, age, disability, disaggregation, but also particular groups. This might vary country to country, other minority in some countries having a specific focus on pastoralists, on uh, minority groups, etc., will be will be important. Um, I think there were also some questions about the support. I think, yeah, Boris was mentioning that, Michael and that, and I think also Jim and, and Michael on the closing remarks will touch upon that. But indeed, um, we, yeah, we, we plan to provide a continuous and collective support for the HPC season to all the operations that require, either with technical um, uh, support or also advocacy support, as I was mentioning last year, that, yeah, to, uh, clarifying messages, etc. But I think also in uh, in line with Ilona's point about, yeah, sometimes that other indicators, in other information from other sectors is key, but because they are the pen holders of owners, uh, it's not always easy how to uh, either access some information or decide where should be placed. Um, I think, yeah, part of the also approach we're taking this year is a strong collaboration with the other clusters. So not only the discussions at the intersectoral level, et cetera, but also with the other clusters to ensure we have common approaches. With health cluster in particular, for instance, now we have the, the joint operational framework. So we um, are looking forward to strengthen the collaboration with them and that translates to the field in terms of better collaboration also for analysis and information sharing. Um, so how to cover that. Let me see. Um, so, Sasha, on your point, I don't know, I, I hope it's, it's clear, but also just to, to reiterate, yes, protection will contribute to all indicators to all the sub pillars, but at the end, we will only have one intersectoral pin. And then this will be complemented by each sector on a specific analysis and pin calculations that will remain as, as before. That will not uh, have. There is discussions on to make sure that at the end, the intersectoral pin. Uh, is aligned to the different sectoral pins, particularly if an area that intersect analysis identifies as low severity or low pin, but there are specific uh, pockets of severity for a specific sector or a specific population group that that also reflects then into the, the final intersectoral calculations. Um, but that's the idea. So the idea will be also a bit to to avoid what happened last year. It was that the intersectoral pin was mostly all the sector pins. Uh, so the severity and the pin calculation was kind of disconnected. The idea is to link them better this this year. Um, and Fanta, on your specific questions about the indicators, yeah, access to services for sure will be key indicators that are including the reference tables. Uh, and we we do know that uh, and are aware that last year in many HNOs. Uh, indicators about acts or lack of access to GBV core services or child protection services or victim assistance services were used in many operations and should continue to be used and they can inform and contribute both to the intersectoral needs analysis but also for their own sectoral needs analysis. And indeed also when we talk about our sector analysis we not only usually rely on specific uh, sectoral indicators, but also on using all the other sectors indicators. So the IPC, for instance, is, is, is a key one for us. Um, so that will continue to, to happen like that. For the intersect analysis, will be probably food security who will be contributed with that specific indicator in any case as, as the owners or producers of that data. So yeah, I'm just checking the, the notes. I think I hope to, to have covered everything. Um, just looking here now at some further questions. A high amount of difference to individual contests on the approach to PID calculation, so we avoid to having use part of the calculation at an impact the overall sectoral pin. Yes. Uh, okay, so what you're uh, the same, yeah, Ilona has mentioned, yeah, the intersectoral pin will be 
one part, and then the sector pin will be a calculation that we, we will use our approach and the indicators that we consider relevant, that we hope also to integrate into the test sector analysis and mainstreaming, as, and as mentioned, both at the context and humanitarian needs. And Christine uh, suggesting a technical session with IMOs at the global level. Yes, I think we were also discussing that probably um, after this introductory webinar um, and all this good feedback and, and comments that we can bring into the finalization of the guidance, uh, probably to have a dedicated section uh, uh, or a webinar with uh, the IMOs just to go more on the technical details about the indicators there. So that's well noted and, and we'll follow up on that. Uh, let me see if there are any other comments. So, yeah, let me know or please in the chat or uh, here again if any other questions were was unanswered or uh, yeah. Uh, I hope we didn't miss anything. Um, uh, I think maybe only Fanta. I think your last question about the reconciliation of PIN for funding. Um, and yeah, how that might be also translated to the to the um, yeah, over represented or under representing uh, of protection as uh, and indeed, I mean, when we look at the PIN, the PIN of protection total last year was around yeah, almost 100 million persons compared to the total intersectoral pin all the, on the same countries of 165 is and around. So yeah, more than, yeah, or 150, so more than 60% or 70% of the total pin, and that compares only to 7% of the funding. So obviously that could be, uh, uh, have to do a lot with con difference in context, targets, uh, but also costing. So I think that's where we want to, to also develop a specific guidance over July and August, ideally, with uh, also in consultation with you on how we we have a more harmonized and systematic way to divide targets and to um, uh, ensure that protection requirements are more associated to to the needs uh, and response uh, of the population. E, uh, so yeah, I think with that, I think Ilona sector has been which also highly relevant to funding, which also highlight, highlight the need to ensure autonomy in terms of the calculation. Yes, totally. On completely, and that's that's something where uh, where all, yeah that will remain um, on the the responsibility of each sector and, and clusters to develop. Okay, so I'm conscious of the time. Thanks for um, yeah being with us a few minutes after the, the expected deadline. Um, hope we covered all your questions, but um, also we took note also um, just to make sure that the different points are are both considering the guidance, but also in the in the field support that we'll provide. So maybe without extending too much the the, the session, we'd like to to give the floor to the global coordinators again to to closing remarks. So William, I'll give the word to you. Um, 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 yeah, maybe just to uh, then also give the word. I understand to to Jim and um, and Michael to close the session. Over to you guys. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, sorry. No, Jim. Jim. Okay, Go thank ahead. You. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, Jim Robinson. It's good to meet you. I'm with the um, Housing, Land and Property AOR. Just wanted to offer just a, mm -hmm. a quick recap. William or of... Jim directly, maybe? Jim, I, I, I hope you're still with us. Yeah, can you not hear me? Oh, is my mic, can you not no, hear me? No, la loud and clear, go oh. ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was just going to offer some, you know, zoom out again after that really rich discussion, just to recap some of the key messages um, before Michael um, closes with some further remarks. Um, one is just to say that we should be um, focusing on ensuring the centrality of protection and inclusivity, as uh, William was uh, talking about in the beginning. How do we do this? Well, by ensuring the protection risks inform the overall collective analysis. So not only through the protection indicators, but also through the expert inputs and the secondary data and the area data as well. Um, and the key common narrative sections like the context shocks and impact analysis. We need to build on that progress from 2020, where we had between 70 and 75 
um, of, with specific AOR sections within the protection chapter in the HNO. Um, it'd be great if we could hit that 100% and we need to support one another to do that. And it's important that we are as context specific as possible. We've, you know, we've seen a lot of hard work with Ultra to enable the AORs to have more space and to have these dedicated pages so we can really um, sort of look at how we can have a strong narrative that's specific to each AOR. And as well as the specific AOR sections, of course, we need to focus on um, enhancing visibility to other key protection areas, for example, protection of civilians, anti-trafficking, mental health and psychosocial support and protection of older persons. And we heard particularly about the uh, inclusion and of importance of including uh, persons with disability in the HNO and HRPs. Um, and um, Ahmed um, um, shared some key points on how to do this in practice. So include disability in the needs overview and risk analysis. And consult persons with disabilities. They are experts in their situations, either their organisations, their help groups, community leaders, get in touch, find out what's going on. And when we design a protection response, asking, is it able to be accessed by everyone? Is it universally accessible? And just wanted to highlight that on the 21st of July, there's, he mentioned there'll be training on including disability in the HNO and HRP that's going to be announced through Ultra. So look out for that. Um, Jennifer also just mentioned that we need to, you know, have that comprehensive flow across protection. So uh, sort of look at how we manage information, but get that consistency across AORs. That it's a real collaborative and coordinated response. Um, the second key key message is just around keep expanding the integrated and multi-sectoral responses and programming. So early discussions with other clusters to see ensure that protection risks inform the sectoral analysis and response priorities, promote integrated and joint programming with protection actors. And there's, a, a lot, there's guidance available for, for that as well. And that, that includes um, advocating with donors together with other sectors to prioritise joint and integrated programming in the funding strategy. And the third key message I just want to uh, re-emphasise would be just that focus on comprehensive response planning, targets and requirements, and that there's going to be further guidance to be developed and disseminated. So look out for an additional HRP webinar and also some dedicated regional events during the Global Protection Forum in early September. Um, so that's just by way of summarising the key messages. And Michael, over to you. Jim and yeah, big big thanks presented to today for us. It's really really helpful, and most importantly, thanks everyone for the questions and the inputs. I want to highlight that there are good examples out there, and uh, they're from the different countries that that participants are joining the call from today. So I want to encourage you to share those. What we've seen is that those good examples are gold uh, for colleagues in, in other contexts to learn and exchange. So whether you're with an AR or with the overall protection cluster, do share those. Uh, we'll make them available across the protection cluster. I also want to encourage you to reach out uh, for support. Again, uh, reach out to your AOR, reach out to the protection cluster. Um, and, and we'll also uh, be exchanging uh, that information. There's reference to information management offices, and I wanted to emphasise the importance of working together, um, working with other sectors, as Jim has said, but for the coordinators and IMOs to really be looking together um, at how they approach uh, the work around um, needs identification, for example. Finally, reaching out to those other sectors is important in terms of also education and centrality protection. So starting the conversation about how information from other sectors is very relevant for protection, I think is actually a great start um, to, to a discussion on, on centrality of protection. Um, with that, a big thank you to everyone. Thanks so much for all of the hard work that you're doing, um, always in difficult times, but especially um, at the moment. Uh, and with that, um, thank you very much. Do, do be in touch over and Thank you. Thanks a lot, Michael and, and Jim. Um, yeah, um, thanks a lot everyone for your participation. We'll be, yeah, as mentioned, sharing the, the presentations um, and the further material 
and we'll be in touch and uh, yeah glad to yeah to i'm happy i'm ready to start the the hpc and um season uh, thanks a lot and bye everyone thanks Ivan. thank you bye